Welcome to video two for week two. In the previous video, I set up the formal logical definition of integrating over arbitrary sets and define the notion of integrable set. That wasn't a very good definition for calculation, so here I want to talk about how I actually calculate integration over a variety of different sets. And I want to use a motivating example here. So I want to think about calculating the volume of a square period pyramid of height a over the interval negative b to b times negative b to b in R2. So if I think about R2 as the axis here, so I have a square that goes from negative b to b um, in this axis and from negative b to b in this axis. So the side length of the base here is actually 2b. And then I have over this a square pyramid of height a. So a is the, is the vertical height from the center here up to the top of the pyramid. And I would like to calculate the volume of that pyramid. So if you actually want this to be the graph of a function, I'm not going to go through the details, but the function you need to get this as a graph, it's got a bunch of strange pieces to it. It involves absolute values in various combinations. It's this function. Again, not going into the details of how I derived this function, but this function will give you a square pyramid over this interval negative b to b times negative b to b. So I would like to integrate this function. That's how I find the volume under the graph of a function is I integrate. So I want to integrate this function f over this interval in R2. The absolute values here are an issue because I can't integrate those directly. I need to integrate this in pieces where these absolute values work. So what I'm going to do first is I'll look at just a quarter of this. And taking a quarter of this and multiplying by 4, since this pyramid is completely symmetrical, um, this quarter that I get, the volume over this quarter, will be exactly one quarter of the whole pyramid. So I can work with um, positive x and y, and that means that I could drop this absolute value. But this one is still a problem, because in this square um, from 0 to b and from 0 to b, this absolute value term depends on whether I'm in this triangle or in this triangle. In this triangle, y is larger, so I'd have to multiply by negative 1. In this triangle, x is larger, so I'd have to just drop the absolute value sign and not multiply by negative 1. By symmetry, I could actually do this in two pieces, but then I'd actually have to integrate over a triangle as opposed to a square. A square is nice because it's an interval, but I can't actually get anywhere with this problem unless I really go to integrating over triangles. So I want to talk about how I'm going to integrate over a triangle. And then if I integrate over a triangle, um, since again this is symmetric, if I look at one half of this, I'll get one half. One half of one quarter is one eighth. So if I integrate over the triangle and multiply by eight, I'll get the entire volume of the pyramid. So how do I integrate over a triangle? So let me take the lower triangle, so the triangle below the line y equals x, uh, going up to this point BB in R2. The way I do this is with variable bounds. So I can take constant bounds in x from 0 to b. If I did constant bounds in both 0 to b times 0 to b, then I've got the whole square, but I don't want the whole square. So for the bounds in y, the bounds in y, I'm going to always start at 0. So I'm going to start at 0 here, but I'm going to stop when I get to the line y equals x, which is the line that bounds this triangle. So the bounds in y now depend on the bounds in x. But that works, because when x, when, when x is 1, I'm only going to go up to y equals 1. When x is 2, I'm only going to go up to y equals 2. When x is 3, I'm only going to go up to y equals 3. This does, in fact, describe the triangle by using variable bounds. And that means I can set up, if t is the triangle, this integral by doing the bounds in x, which are constant from 0 to b, and the bounds in y, which are variable from 0 to x. And then on that triangle, I can drop both these absolute value signs. These are both positive, so that's fine. x is larger than y on that triangle, so I can drop the absolute value signs and simplify this and actually have a function that I can integrate. I'll do this integral in a couple of the slides, but I want to point out that this is not the only way to describe the triangle. I could instead have chosen bounds in y that were constant and bounds in x that were variable. And if I do that, then for the bounds in x, I have to start at the line y equals x. So if y is 1, I start at x equals 1. If y is 2, I start at x equals 2. And then x goes all the way up to b. So the bounds in x are from y to b. And this is a little bit different. So it depends on 
which bound you choose as constant and which bound you choose as variable. And in this way, we can, we can describe a variety of shapes of sets that we want to integrate over using variable bounds. If I do this, notice here the first thing I did, I had x as the variable with constant bounds. It has to show up in the outside integral, and y depends on x has to show up on the inside integral. This makes sense because this x only makes sense inside the x integral. If I switch them, if y has constant bounds, then it has to show up in the outside integral. And if x depends on y, it has to show up inside the y integral. And this is the key thing to remember with constant bounds, is that if a variable shows up in a bound, then that has to be inside the integral for that variable. A variable can never show up outside of its whole integral. So let me go back to the original thing I did and just summarize this briefly. I'm not going to go through all the steps. But this is how I set up the integral. I simplified the absolute value to get this function. And then I integrate. So I'm integrating this in y. There are no y's here, so I just get a constant. So my antiderivative is going to be ay, axy over b. And then when I go to evaluate on these variable bounds, I just replace the variable y with its variable bound. So replacing it with 0 is just going to give me 0. Replacing it with x means this y gets turned into an x. This y gets turned into an x to give me x squared. So it works exactly the same. I just now have the other variable in the bounds of the variable that I'm currently integrating. In the y integral, I'm allowed to have x in the bounds. And when I evaluate the bounds, I just put that x into where y used to be. Then I just have a single variable in x, and I can finish it with normal steps. And I will get that the integral of that function over that triangle is a, which is the height and b, which was half of the side lengths, a, b squared over 6. As I argued before, that was 1 eighth of the total volume. So the volume of this pyramid with side length 2b and height a is, in fact, 4ab squared over 3. Let me be really, really clear about this point about the order of variable bounds. So if I have the y integral inside and the x integral outside, then the y bounds can involve x but the x bounds which are outside have to be constant. If I have the x integral inside and the y outside, then the x bounds can involve y, they can be some expressions in y, but the y bounds outside have to be constant. If I try to set up it, an integral this way, with y inside and x outside, but these bounds depended on an x, this just wouldn't make any sense. I'd have the variable showing up in bounds outside its own integral that doesn't that doesn't line up nicely, that doesn't give me something I can actually accomplish. I'm going to have variables left over when I do the bounds. So we have to be really careful that we set this up such that we have constant bounds on the outside and variable bounds only inside the integral that, that, that works in that variable that we are using. This is an R2. I can do this in R3 as well, and in fact, in as many dimensions as I want. For a quick example in R3, this should be an x. If I have an x outside with constant bounds, then the y variable inside could depend on x, and the z variable, which is inside both x and y, could depend on x and y. But it's the same idea that if x's and y's show up here, then they are inside their integrals. If x's show up here, they're inside that integral. A variable in a bound can only show up inside the integral in that variable.